Our scripture lesson today is from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. The Valley of Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come in upon you, and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them. The skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord of God, Come from, from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. O my people, I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and will act, says the Lord. Thanks be to God for this prophecy. Will you pray with me, please? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would fall freely on all of us gathered here wherever we are in body, mind, or spirit, that you would free us, that you would send us out. We pray in the name of Christ. One of my first memorable National Parks visits was to Yosemite in California. I was six years old. My parents sent me with two of their friends who were attending a family camp out there. And I think it was the farthest from home I had ever been. It was definitely the farthest from my parents I had ever been. And I'm sure that it was beautiful and breathtaking and Yosemite and all of that. But what I remember most vividly is looking up at the stars one night outside our cabin and bursting into tears. I was inconsolable. I was inconsolable because we had watched a movie in first grade about the solar system and about how the sun is going to burn out one day and end all possibility for life on Earth. And I guess that that very uncomfortable knowledge had resided somewhere inside of my little self until that night in Yosemite National Park where it came right up to the surface. And I had my very first existential crisis at the ripe old age of six. The trajectory of life on this planet 
Aiming for death and decay and irreversible destruction was just too much to swallow. And really, it still is. I feel that dread, that sense of overwhelm come over me when I read about the fires in Hawaii this week, or the floods in China, or the oceans hitting their hottest ever recorded temperature. Or right here at home on days when the air quality is so bad in D.C. that you can smell the burning. And we keep kids and vulnerable people inside because it's not safe to breathe. This very strong sense backed up by science that we are marching toward immense destruction. Suffering of humans and other living things like there is a dead end in our future and we can't seem to find or commit to another route. It's just this one path, this one trajectory, and the final chapter is not good. Now, as distant as you may feel from the people of ancient Israel, like in the Bible, like their problems are very much not the same as our problems, I want us to take a minute and be open to the possibility that there is some shared human experience there. That what they felt looking at their past and their future could have some strong parallels with the overwhelm we feel looking at ours. So come with me to the 500 BCE. All of the religious and political leaders, the educated and artistic classes of people of Jerusalem have been deported to Babylon. They're living in exile after the invasion and the takeover by the Babylonians. Jerusalem in ruins. Now the narrative of how this happened, as we have it in the Bible, was that there had been this high point of Israel's faithfulness and prosperity, but the leaders had gone way wrong hundreds of years ago. They broke in the covenant between God and God's people, worship was all wrong. Caring for the poor and the vulnerable was not a thing at all. The nation had gotten its priorities way off. And despite warnings from generations of prophets, Israel was on an irreversible downward spiral. They had messed up so big and so bad that this devastating conquest by the Babylonians and subsequent exile were the direct results of their leaders' waywardness. Now, whether or not that is the objective historical truth, it doesn't actually matter for us right now. What matters is that this was the narrative that was told, that the people had gotten it into their minds that they were at the end of their story. All of the terrible outcomes that had been predicted were happening. Children were dying. Beloved landmarks and homes and places for worship destroyed. The people were disconnected from God and from one another. And this dead end had been a long time coming. Israel had been on this track for generations. And the prophet Ezekiel, who we heard from today, was coming in at what seemed like the very last chapter of a tragic cautionary tale. The final scene before curtain. His understanding of the trajectory was God creates universe. God chooses people to be in covenant with. People break covenant. It gets worse and worse and worse, and eventually the whole thing just gets burned down the end. In today's scripture reading, Ezekiel has a vision in which he's traipsing through the wreckage of that last chapter, a valley of bones, arch. Now, years ago, maybe, these bones were connected to each other, covered in skin with tendons and muscles and organs and breath. Maybe decades or centuries ago, the tiny bones were part of hands that could create beauty or hold other hands. Those longer bones were parts of legs. Those curved ones were rib cages protecting a beating heart or lungs that contracted and expanded. Those jaw bones opened and closed, and prayers and kindnesses and songs came out. Long ago, this was a much different scene, but all of that is over now, and we are 
with piles of bones, relics of life that is no longer. Mortal, God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? 200 million years ago, there was a tropical forest in what we now call the desert southwestern United States. There's a towering canopy of trees and lush undergrowth and abundant rivers and dinosaurs and prehistoric sharks and all sorts of flying things. Now, if we fast forward those 200 million years, a couple of ice ages, some continental drifting, we get to about 13,000 years ago, where again, what we call the desert southwest is a tropical forest. Huge mammals live there. People hunt them. Later, they start to farm. But the climate changed so that by around the 500 BCE, the same time Ezekiel was in exile on the other side of the world, the people living in this region of present-day Arizona had to make some major adaptations. The habitat was drier, there were no more big mammals available for hunting, and by the year 1400 there was a severe and prolonged drought. The people moved out of the area entirely. But the drought ended and some new grasslands emerged, but then the Spanish and then the American settlers came with their livestock and their land grabbing, and the grasslands were decimated by overgrazing, left leaving nothing but desert. Now, all of the, that first series of climate changes from 200 million years ago to like the year zero, if you're thinking about a timeline, I walked this out in the sanctuary yesterday. It gets us from that stained glass window in the back to this one. That's 200 million years to the year zero. And up there at the stained glass window, what we call Arizona is a desert environment, but it's still lively. There's plenty of water supply, it's vibrant. Still all the way up to the last couple hundred years, relatively stable. It's just in the amount of time equivalent so less than like a speck of dust on that stained glass window that we've gotten to the point where we are today, globally and specifically in Arizona, where a state analysis found this year that they're on track to run out of groundwater in the next 100 years. This has been the trajectory. This is where we're heading, where once there was a tropical forest is now Arizona, where once there was grassland is now parched soil, where once there was a vibrant community, a valley of bones. Is that the end of the road? Can these bones live? God asks Ezekiel to stand in a valley of disintegrated possibility, of dead and dusty dreams a valley of people who are gone, mortal. Can these bones live? Well, the logical narrative says no. If we're following the trajectory, whether it's the history and disintegration of God's people, Ezekiel's homeland, or the trajectory of life in general on this planet, heading toward a fiery end brought on by climate change or war or regular life cycles, the answer, is no. These bones cannot live. We reach the inevitable end here and there is nothing that can be done. But Ezekiel doesn't give the logical answer. Maybe he senses that God is up to something because he says, oh God, you know. I mean, this looks like the end of the road to me, but I'm going to toss that one back to you, God. And God invites Ezekiel to go out on a limb and prophesy, to speak something that doesn't necessarily make sense given all the evidence of death, speak life. Speak boldly and bravely of possibility, of something that you yourself can't see or possibly imagine, but speak it anyway. God invites Ezekiel to stand in destruction with eyes wide open to it, not denying it, heart fully feeling the pain, and, and to invoke a power beyond himself to help. 
And Ezekiel does. He does what God tells him to, and in his vision, the bones, they start to connect one to another, and they form bodies, people, and they rise up. And God says, Ezekiel, you're getting it. Prophesy to the breath now, to the ruach, to the spirit, and let it fill these bones so that everybody can breathe. And he does. And suddenly that valley is filled with life. It buzzes with potential energy. Because if this can happen, then what else? The bones of the past, of people long gone, rise to the surface. Only now they're changed. They're in a new context. And they're indicators of what more could be possible. Of a power beyond what we can see. For Ezekiel and for God and for God's people, they're evidence of a new covenant of people not cut off, but welcomed back, of God doing a whole new thing through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, the breath at Pentecost, the spirit that has been knocking down walls and welcoming people back and enlivening them since that time. In the barren desert of northeastern Arizona, Ancient trees from that tropical forest of 200 million years ago have risen to the surface because of this wild geological process that deprived them of oxygen when they were buried in the volcanic ash. Their regular trajectory of decay was interrupted and the spaces in the wood slowly filled with mineral deposits. And those slowly took the place of the wood as it broke down, eventually transforming the logs into nearly solid quartz. And they appear multicolored because of the impurities in the quartz. These rainbow trees, these prehistoric fossils rising to the surface on the parched earth of Arizona. In one sense, they're dry bones. Bones of something that once lived and never can again. But in another light, they're beautiful markers of possibility. Of something completely unexpected. The past comes back transformed. For these trees and for Ezekiel, what seemed like the end wasn't the end at all. We think we're out of options, and then God comes in with something completely new, something beautiful, something we never would have thought of. There is this one image that really resonated with me in all my reading about Petrified Forest National Park this week, and they call it a conscience pile. And what it is, is it's a pile of rocks that visitors stole from the park lands. You know, they just like picked up a piece of petrified wood because it was pretty. And even though they knew better, they took it home with them. They wanted to own it. They sensed scarcity, maybe, that other people were probably doing this too, stealing rocks. And if that keeps up, well, soon there won't be any left. So I better grab one while I can. What a complex and destructive human phenomenon. Maybe the basis of why we can't get our footing in addressing climate change as a nation or as a global collection of nations. We're not budging or making any sacrifices until China does. Yeah, there's an impending shortage, this multifaceted crisis of climate and resources, but if no one else is going to make a sacrifice for the sake of the very near future, well, then neither am I. And I might as well take up whatever I can, use those fossil fuels while they're still here, water my lawn and my golf course and my swimming pool, I might as well pocket this rock. Because at this rate, there won't be any left. For more than a century now, people have been pilfering pieces of the petrified forest, wanting to own it, not trusting that we can own something together and steward it together. Only what's happened is people pilfered the pieces was that there was this pretty powerful campaign by the Park Service, these rumors of being cursed if you take a rock. This strategic messaging that induced so much guilt that people who stole the rock started to feel terrible about it. And they wrote apology letters and they mailed the rocks back. 
And the Park Service has collected the letters. I read them online this week. They are fascinating. And it's taken the rocks back that people mailed. Only they can't put it back in the National Park because they don't know the actual history of each rock that's been sent back. They don't know if it really came from that exact area. And just dropping something back there could result in a whole lot of falsified research one day. And who knows what other consequences. So anyway, the rocks can't go back to where they were stolen from. And instead, they made a pile outside the park boundaries, what's called a conscience pile, like a massive visual representation of human guilt, of our angst about knowing we've done something wrong, and we ourselves can't quite right it. We can't quite put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We want to make atonement, but we don't know how, so we do our best, and here's this conscience pile bearing witness to our attempts. I looked at the images this week, and I thought about the despair that sets in when we feel like we've broken something beyond repair. Whether it's a relationship, someone's trust, or we really mess up at work, or we cause brokenness in our family or our church, or whether it's like our whole planet. Something we feel like we've broken beyond repair, and that rock we stole, that thing we said, those habits of hard-heartedness in regard to our impacts on creation, start to weigh on our conscience. And we wish we could do something, and so we make a gesture Toward repair. We mail our rock back. We make a change. We initiate contact with someone. We make the first move, and it doesn't get us all the way back to heal. It doesn't recreate what used to be, but that conscience pile stands for something. Because over time, far beyond our time, the earth will keep shifting. And that conscience pile in Arizona will move. Those rocks will become part of new landscapes, new homes. God's going to take what was offered up as an act of contrition and do something with it that we never could have imagined. In the story of Ezekiel and the dry bones, Ezekiel does Ezekiel's part, and God does God's part. And so taking it back, to climate change, to our world, what is our part? One thing that I initially found weird and now decided I love most about this scripture is that God keeps addressing Ezekiel as mortal. Mortal, can these bones live? Prophesy, mortal, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And I love this because it's a continual reminder that Ezekiel is finite. His life has limits. His power has limits. He, in this sense, is like the opposite of God. And yet God makes him partner. God recruits him to be the prophet who stands in the valley and speaks life. Ezekiel cannot do everything, but he can do something. And God finds that something useful. To quote a poem written in honor of Oscar Romero, we cannot do everything. And that enables us to do something and to do it very well. We are finite and the problems we face are vast and God calls us anyway. God calls us to be present, to be brave enough to stand in the valleys of dry bones and name what we see to name what we see and to give voice to a different vision. Prophesy. Speak life and hope and breath and truth. Advocate and organize and make individual sacrifices and collective commitments. We can choose a different path, a different trajectory, because God is a God of possibility and therefore we are a people of hope and commitment. Yes, we get overwhelmed and we break down in tears, whether we are six years old in Yosemite or adults reading the news. 
we get overwhelmed because we're present, because we're willing to go with God to visit the Dry Bones Valley and feel how desolate it is. We get overwhelmed, but then we keep listening for God's voice and we don't stop trying. We add our stones, our meager offerings as they are to the conscience pile. We participate in healing as wholeheartedly as we can. And we trust that we are not alone in this. That there is possibility that God doesn't leave our side and that there can be there must be breath for all. I invite you to pray with me a prayer for healing. I will um, say at the end of each section, spirit of possibilities, and if you could respond, bring healing. Spirit of possibilities, bring healing. God, we are before you as your children, your people, in need of healing. Our bodies, so many of us, our bodies in need of healing. The bodies of our friends and loved ones too, and so we pray your spirit, your breath, come over all who are hurting, facing surgeries or treatments, hoping for a miracle, losing capabilities they once enjoyed. Spirit of possibilities, bring healing. We pray for minds and hearts and souls, God, also in need of healing. Our own anxieties and addictions, the deep valleys of loneliness or despair, and for all those we love and those we don't even know are suffering. We pray your spirit, your breath, lighten burdens. Soften the sharp edges, bring healing helpers and listeners and medicines and courage to keep going. Spirit of possibilities, bring healing. God of all the families in the Bible, with all their stories of deceit and greed and grudges and betrayal, you know full well that we need healing in our relationships, even when we don't want to think about it in families, between neighbors, friendships from that have withered on the vine, from those relationships to the whole human family, the delusion of white supremacy and the evil it continues to bring, war within and between nations, senseless gun violence, all the ways the sacred bonds of common humanity are defamed. O oh God, we pray your spirit, your breath, change our hearts at home and everywhere we go. Somehow work wonders so we might truly be free. Spirit of possibilities, bring healing. And God of all creation, lest we turn away one second longer and claim on one side that there's nothing wrong or on the other side that there's nothing that can be done this point, we cry out for your power to compel us, all of us, every person, every leader, on every level, in every nation. Move us to decisive action to address climate change and the devastation it is already bringing. May our priorities be free from selfishness and greed, dissolve our toxic hubris, wake us up. And please work alongside us as we seek to be agents of healing on this fragile planet. We pray your spirit, your breath, cover and protect the suffering ones, amplify the voices of the prophets, move us toward justice and equity, spur us on when we feel like giving up. Give breath to the children and to their children breath to the forests, breath to the oceans and the creatures of water and sky and all the earth. Spirit of possibilities, bring healing. Receive our prayers, God. The ones we have offered now, the ones that we weep, the ones that we whisper. 
We offer ourselves as your instruments, and we pray in the name of Jesus, our hope. Amen. Thank you to all who took part in leading our worship today, and thank you, Brandon, for running our live stream. Hello to everyone worshiping on Zoom. We hope that you will join us for coffee hour, for snacks, and to help pack backpacks in the fellowship hall. Just follow the people there, and we will get those backpacks and as we go out, we go out knowing, believing, trusting that our God is a God of possibilities. And so we indeed will be people of hope and of commitment. Go in peace. NBUMC Weekly is a production of North Bethesda United Methodist Church, located in Bethesda, Maryland. Follow us on YouTube and Facebook at North Bethesda UMC or on Instagram at Loving All Neighbors. All music is licensed via Christian Copyright Licensing International, CCLI.